very privileged to have Professor Naila Kabir with us. Um, Naila Kabir is Professor of Gender and Development at the Department of Gender Studies uh, and the Department of International Development at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, she is a social economist working on uh, the economic and social interactions between households, communities, and the wider economy. She has published extensively on gender, poverty, social exclusion, labor markets, livelihoods, social protection, and citizenship in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Naila has been active in developing frameworks and methodologies uh, for integrating gender concerns into policy and planning work, with seminal contributions to framing the measurement of women's empowerment and agency. Her talk today is titled Gender, Justice, um, and the Well-Being Economy, Some Reflections on Our Common Future. Over to you, Professor Kabir. So, um, should I start? And is someone got my slides? Uh, are you happy to share your slides or? Are you happy to share your slides? No, I, I, I did send them. Will you be able to share them for me? <laughs> if, if not, I will try and find them. Okay, sure. So I'll just start by saying, um, I'm, I'm very sorry that I couldn't come to Lahore as I had planned, but uh, there was a lot of um, uh, dis disruption in my agenda, so it wasn't possible. And it's never as satisfactory doing it by Zoom, but I guess second best. Um, I should also say that this is a fairly recent, a new topic, something that um, I'm preparing for uh, a, a new program of research at LSE, uh, which will, you know, as we are all aware of the kind of climate catastrophe that we're facing, I think it's becoming harder and harder to talk about development per se without taking cognizance of where the world is heading if we don't do something. So what I've been doing is reading the literature uh, on this topic and trying to work out what, as a person who's been interested in gender justice, what we can try and bring to this topic. So. Um, You'll have to bear with me that this is a very raw presentation, you know, based on very recent reading of the literature. Uh, and it's, it's heading towards trying to ask, how are we going to shift the kind of growth paradigm that has brought us to this brink? So I'll wait until the uh, slides are ready and then I'll begin. Okay, please put, put it on, yeah. Okay, so, um, what I'd like to cover in the 40 minutes that I have is go back to the idea of the gross domestic product, uh, what it means, why it's important, what it leaves out. I want to also look at the way that the development discourse, the, the way that we think about development uh, has been changing over the years, very often in response to what has been left out of the GDP. 
what it doesn't take into account of. I want to talk very briefly about why we've got to where we are, you know, the drivers of ill-being. Uh, I want to look at the kinds of measures people are talking about um, as an alternative to the GDP or as a complement to the GDP. And then I want to conclude by looking at what the literature is telling us about how feminists have thought about a pathway to a, a well-being economy. So could you shift to the next slide, please? So I think all of you in the room will be familiar with what the gross domestic product is. And you will know that really uh, earlier to the 1940s, we didn't have such a measure that it got developed as uh, Europe and the US uh, were moving into war footing and needed to know a bit more about the resources that they had at their disposal. And so um, a group of economists, the US and the UK, got together to try and come up with a measure that would help them assess what wealth a country had. And the GDP became, became the measure, and it measures really the value of final output, goods and services that are bought and sold in the marketplace. And that was the original idea, because obviously these economies, the UK, US, Europe, were very much market economies, and therefore a great deal of what is produced could be captured by market transactions. But that then got adopted in the 1950s by the UN uh, and who drew up the, the kind of statistical boundary of what would be counted as GDP. But over time, with, with uh, criticisms and, and comments from people in the, uh, in, the, in the global south, in less developed countries, the definition of the GDP was expanded to include goods and services that could have been sold, but were consumed at home. So for instance, uh, the, the rearing of cattle, even if you didn't sell the milk, you could have sold the milk and you could uh, value that milk as a part of the GDP. So little by little, we saw an expansion of the concept of the gross domestic product to include many things that were not necessarily sold in the market, but could have been sold. So they did have a kind of a market price. But despite this expansion, what never did get um, included were certain things. First and foremost was nature, natural resources. Only when you exploited natural resources in order to sell them to the marketplace. So when you cut down a tree and sold the wood, only then did natural products become a part of the GDP. And the ecological services, so having forests that you know, uh, contributed to the, the purity of the climate, the purity of, of, of uh, the air that we breathe, that too does, does not count in the GDP. Secondly, what was purposefully left out of the GDP were the unpaid care services that largely women and girls in the world provide whether they're providing it in the global north or in the global south. And the reason for that is that um, it was felt that while you could give a value, a monetary value to the, to the um, uh, subsistence production, you know, to, to, uh, to, to livestock, to crops that you grew for your own consumption, care services did not seem to lend themselves to the market economy. First and foremost, it was agreed that they were not done for profit, that they were done for the, for the, for the good of the family. Second, it was felt that they were not responsive to market forces. And that actually changes in care um, would not have much impact on the economy. And of course, to some extent, this is true in the sense that unpaid care work goes on no matter whether the economy is in a, a boom or a recession. So care services, looking after the elderly, looking after children and so on, was not a part of the GDP. There were two other exclusions that are significant. And that is inequality, that while the gross domestic product 
was the sum total of all the uh, of the value of all goods and services produced in the economy. It was a single statistic, and there was no. It it was what did not get measured was how that GDP was distributed. So you could have high levels of growth coexisting with high levels of inequality, but that was not of concern to the people who were measuring. And the final exclusion of the GDP is that it didn't distinguish between the marketing of good things and the marketing of bad things. So, you know, marketing of uh, food and clothing was put on a par with the marketing of armaments, of drugs, and so on. So the GDP measure did not, you know, you could be growing because of a drug trade, or you could be growing because you were exporting uh, food to the rest of the world. So it didn't make any kind of normative judgments about what was and was not being produced. Could I have the next slide, please? Now, the GDP, even though those who invented it, who, who came up with it, people like Kuznets, etc., had never intended it to be a measure of um, the well-being in the economy, of how the welfare of people, it was simply a measure of what was being marketed, the value of final marketed goods. It very, over time, it became the way that countries were judged. So a country was doing well if there was a, a growth in the GDP, and it was not doing well if there was a, a decline. Countries were ranked by their GDP according to, you know, if there were high growth countries, they were ranked much higher. So even though it had not initially been intended as a measure of, um, of how people, of, of other aspects of people's lives, it became the statistic by which countries were judged to be doing well or badly. So I want to take you very quickly through all the ways in which uh, this preoccupation with the growth in the GDP has featured in development over the years. So in the post-war period, as many, many countries, including ours, uh, became independent, their preoccupation was to catch up with, with the global north, with what was then the West. And so the preoccupation was with state-led industrialization, you know, with the protection for infant industries, in order that the countries of the, the newly independent countries of the global south could catch up. So, and there was an assumption then that if you could uh, have, uh, you know, industrialization, and if you could have growth, that growth would necessarily uh, generate the employment and the um, and the reduction in poverty that you wanted to see. However, the 50s and 60s, we did see countries growing, but we also saw the rise in unemployment and in poverty. So. Sometime in the late 60s, there was a, a concern with the fact that even with growth, we were not seeing a reduction in poverty and, unemployed, and, poverty and unemployment. And so we got a, 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 a new way of thinking about growth, which was, yes, countries should grow, but there should be measures put in place to meet basic needs to uh, address poverty alleviation and unemployment. So this was the period of redistribution of growth. Uh, and I think it was in the 70s, you've got McNamara taking over the World Bank and a uh, number of economists talking about redistribution with growth. So you grow and then you redistribute. Well, that soon came to an end by the sometime in the 70s because of the rising oil prices because of the whole uh, debt crisis, uh, you know, a lot of countries in the global south found themselves uh, unable to uh, proceed without borrowing money from uh, initially from the private banks and then from the IMF. And with that, we all we 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 are aware that this was the rise of neoliberal thinking, and um, you know, it began with Reaganomics with Thatcherism, but we shifted once again to the idea of growth 
but this time market-led rather than state-led. So the seven, from the 80s onwards, we saw the imposition of structural adjustment policies across the world. And, uh, you know, a set of policies that believed in the power of the unregulated market to deliver on, on growth. So we saw, um, you know, it began in Latin America, Africa, it spread to other parts of the world. The deregulation of markets, you know, the privatization of state enterprise, cut back in state expenditures and expenditures for poverty alleviation and for welfare, the liberalization of trade and, uh, you know, a, a real shift to paying back your debts and therefore exporting goods so you earn the foreign exchange. And the idea was that rather than growth trickling down, as in the past, we would see the growth as a rising tide that would lift all boats. So even very poor people, once the market economy, the deregulated market economy started to deliver, we would see it uh, addressing the people at the bottom. So it was a fo form of trickle down, uh, but this time not state-led growth, but market-led growth. And it also became very quickly clear that many countries that had adopted these policies were not being able to um, address poverty in their own countries. And because of the cutbacks in public expenditure, we're not being able to spend on welfare, on uh, health, education, and on poverty. So uh, the famous book that came out at the time was, of course, Adjustment with a Human Face. But Adjustment with a Few Human Face expanded into a much greater concern with human development, human-centered growth. And endogenous theories of growth made it clear that, you know, education, skills, knowledge were engines of growth. So we saw what I would call from, let's say, the publication of Human uh, Adjustment with the Human Face, the 1990 um, UN uh, report, the Human Development Report, we saw a return to concerns with, with uh, you know, with moving away from user fees or for health and education, putting much more emphasis on exemptions from these fees. So an attempt to acknowledge that growth, you know, neoliberal growth was not delivering on some of the other things that mattered to people, including health, education, so on. So I think that was a period where, uh, again, we, because of the rise of the East Asian economies, which was seen as uh, having adopted a labor intensive growth strategy, but also inve investing in their human resources, we saw a greater attention being paid to the idea of human development. And we also saw the fact that many people who were not benefiting from the transition to markets needed some kind of safety nets. So sometime, and particularly when the East Asian crisis happened in the late 1990s, uh, the World Bank and others started talking in terms of um, safety nets to cushion people in times of crisis, uh, to cushion people in the transition to uh, a new liberalized economy. Then I think the next round of growth thinking was about inclusive growth, because by now, what was becoming clear is that countries were growing, but with that was a growth in inequality, that the fruits of growth were concentrated on people at the top, the, the, the wealthier people, and that you needed to rethink the growth strategy in a much more broad-based way. So then we got to the newest round of iteration of inclusive growth. And if you like, what is uh, you know symbolic of this was the fact that when the MDGs came to an end and we got the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that a very explicit one of the goals, I think it's Global 10, is de deals with inequality within countries and between countries. So inequality now started to rise. And as you recall, it was not a part of the GDP. So <clears throat> for a long time, the focus had been on absolute poverty. That what we need to do is make sure that the people at the bottom, you know, the people whose income doesn't allow them to, to feed themselves, uh, we need to take care of them. 
now inequality, not just the fact that the people at the bottom wouldn't meet their basic needs, but that whatever fruits of growth were accruing were now were being co were concentrated amongst the, those with wealth, those with capital. So if you like, we have had these various iterations and what has been the final iteration is where we are today, is the whole issue of the environment has now come onto the agenda in a very big way. So I think sometime along with in these, these different kinds of growths all overlapped. So along with this uh, focus on inclusive growth, on broad-based growth, poor poor growth, whatever you want to call it, we are now becoming much more concerned about how does one conserve the, the, the environment? How does one um, halt global warming? You know, are we in danger of destroying the planet because we are transgressing all the planetary boundaries? So where we are today is the uh, discussion about green growth. And what I wanted to point to you, point out to you, is that there has been a very consistent use of the noun growth. In all of these, we've been talking about growth. What has changed is the adjective. So we've got trickle-down growth, redistribution growth, 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 but there has been no attempt to question whether growth itself should be there in, in the way that we think about the future. And only now we are seeing an attempt to rethink growth itself. So the current debate, and the one that I'm all, not all that familiar with, is about green growth. So it's one more version of growth, but this time bearing in mind climate change, climate crisis, uh, environmental destruction, and so on, versus deep growth. In other words, for the first time, we are contemplating whether the idea of limitless, infinite growth is the best thing for human beings. And, uh, you know, I've been listening to some of the debates about deep growth to try and educate myself. And I think it's, you know, if we talk about green growth, growth remains there at the center, but it is decoupled from resource depletion that we try and you know move away from material inputs that are harmful to the planet to knowledge, skills, technology, and so on, and that we use the market to um, make sure that people who pollute pay for the pollution. But of course, the people who pollute can then sell off uh, their responsibility for paying for the pollution to others. So you see a, a market developing in, uh, in, in, in the cost of pollution, Whereas degrowth, and I, you know, it's a, it's a misleading term in a way, because it's not saying that we don't grow at all. I think as far as I've understood, the people who, who promote degrowth are saying that the, it is the, the North, the rich countries of the global North that need to stop growing because a lot of their growth is in unnecessary, you know, harmful carbon emitting, goods and services, that as yet the people in the global south who are not responsible for a great feed of the carbon emissions need to, you know, slow down their growth perhaps, but not to, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's a, a planned decline in the things that are harmful to the climate and a planned rise in the things that are not. But of course, in all of this, there has to be some redistribution. Because countries, if the countries of the global south are not going to be able to grow in the way that the north did, uh, you know, they will need support to move away from this very harmful pathways of growth. So this whole idea of loss and damage funds is a way of, of redistributing. But going back to the issue of gender, you know, one of the things that is very striking is that you know, inequality has come on. Inequality, which was excluded from the GDP, is now becoming a part of the, the conversation. Uh, the natural resources and ecological services, which were excluded from the GDP, are now coming onto the agenda. Uh, the distinction between harmful and not harmful goods is not is also coming onto the agenda. 
what I think as those of us who are, you know, interested in making sure that one half of the human race is treated as, as, with as much attention as the other half, we'll find that gender itself has always entered all of these various um, phases of growth as, a, as an instrument. So when we talked about trickle-down growth, the earlier period, there was a huge focus on population growth. And if there was an interest in women at all, it was as in terms of fertility rates. So that early period of growth and later as well was accompanied by a real a determination to you know, promote family planning, get women to adopt uh, contraceptives because population growth was seen as uh, eating up the fruits of growth. When we saw redistribution with growth, we uh, I remember the kind of um, publications that came out and you know, it was pointed out that if you want to meet the basic needs of the poor, uh, you know, food, health, etc., it was women, poorer women, that were primarily responsible for producing this. And there was a whole language about female-headed households as being the poorest of the poor, a language that has been since challenged. But nevertheless, it was one way of getting gender issues onto what was then the mainstream agenda of redistribution with growth and um, addressing poverty. When we shifted to uh, laissez-faire growth, you know, suddenly the interest was in uh, to what extent, are, and particularly in Africa, you know, women are the farmers. If we want Africa to grow its food crops, to export crops, etc., you need to address uh, the constraints that prevented women farmers from responding. It's called the, the, the supply side argument that gender roles, gender constraints preventing people from responding to market prices. Then, of course, with pro poor growth, adjustment to the human phase, MDGs, we saw the MDGs included a rather superficial uh, measure of gender equality as um, equality in education, and more women in parliament, and so on. And in, in inclusive growth as well, um, you know, there has been now a big attempt to get women into the labor market. And um, we do see, at, you know, there have been a, a lot of uh, studies that say that gender equality in employment, in education, increase the pace of growth in countries. So if you want inclusive growth, you want to make sure that women have the education and the employment opportunities they need. So, and now with the gender and environment issue, you know, women are the keepers of the, the forests and the farms and so on and so on. Um, you know, they're somehow closer to nature. There's a kind of eco-feminist strand in this case. What I think has been really the case is that we talk about growth with gender justice. You know, gender justice, in other words, addressing some of the patriarchal constraints which take many different forms across the world. Uh, there hasn't been explicit attention to that issue of equalizing relationships between men and women, boys and girls across the world as a goal in its own right. So could we have the next slide, please? So one of the things that I've been very interested in and, you know, kind of educating myself on in a way is why have we got to this stage where organizations like Oxfam and so on are giving us statistics that, you know, income distribution is unequal, but it is not as unequal as wealth distribution. And why have we got the stage where we have allowed the steady pattern of a growth that disproportionately benefits the 1%? And the, the figures, I think, are very alarming. You know, 1% of the world's population own like 46% of the world's wealth, and the poorest 10% own barely anything at all. And looking again, as I say, this is a literature that I'm reading at the moment. And looking at this literature, I think I find that a lot of people go back to the work of Paul Pola uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, who was writing in the 1940s, uh, after you know the Great Depression that took place in Europe and America in 1929. Uh, you know, when huge uh, Wall Street collapsed, you know, people threw themselves out the window, uh, many people lost their savings, and it was followed soon after 
by the Second World War. So Polanyi was trying to explain from his position in the 40s what had gone wrong. And his explanation has been quite influential because what we have been going through since the laissez-faire economics of the 80s onwards to, to today uh, resembles to some extent the problem that he was talking about. So what Polanyi said is that, you know, we've always had markets and we've always had um, trade. These things are not, you know, unique to the, to the present time. What has changed, what changed in the course of industrialization is, is the deregulation of, of markets. That in the course of industrialization, as you know, the countries of, uh, of the UK, of Europe, began to engage in the expansion of their economies and the expansion of trade and colonizing the rest of the world, a major shift took place. And that was up till that point, production had been governed by uh, mutuality, by redistribution, by cultural norms. So trade and markets were embedded within society. So whether we talked about you know, feudalism or whether we talked about poor laws, etc. Production was governed by social norms, by householding arrangements. And, so and what happened in the course of industrialization is that these protections began to be lifted in the interests of the pursuit of free trade. And while this led to a huge you know, accumulation of wealth in these countries, it also was accompanied by generalized commodification, you know, generalized production for the market as markets grew. But he pointed out that there were three commodities that were now being sold on the marketplace that were not intended for the market. They had not been produced for the market. Everything that you sold in the market, you sold in order to produce for the market. But he said there were three commodities that were now up for sale in the marketplace, which were not produced one was land, you know, land was not produced by people. It existed as a part of our natural endowments. And for land, you can think of natural resources in general. The other was labor that, you know, the, the labor that people provided had not been produced for the market. It was a part of human, the human person and money. And money was a, a way of measuring the value of goods and services but it was not in and of itself produced for the market. And he said, that, oh, okay, time flies. <laughs> okay, so, and what he pointed out is by treating these land, labor, and, and, and money as if they were market commodities, society found itself move, heading towards disaster that, you know, uh, labor, you know, free, freed from, from uh, their villages, free to sell their labor power. You cannot treat labor as a commodity. Treating nature as a commodity is, of course, the kind of destruction that we have seen. And money itself is only a, a measure of value, but when you start selling money and credit and so on, you've got the depression. And I think what Nancy Fraser has done is taken the work of Polanyi and brought it up to date. And she points out that today we are once again in an untrammeled pursuit of market forces, uh, but it still needs this non-commodified sphere. It still needs somewhere to go when profits start to decline in one sector or another. And so now we're seeing markets in land, in natural resources, in, in you know extraction and so on. And we're also seeing markets in in labor, but the, it in, also in the process of reproducing labor. And this is where she points out that it is women and girls, women in particular, that have been responsible for the reproduction of labor. And that is increasingly coming under market forces. So the whole issue of care comes into the picture. And now we're seeing 
more and more of care being bought and sold in the marketplace. And not only care, but sexual services, surrogacy, etc. And so what she's pointing out is what Polanyi was looking at in, in the 40s and about the previous era, we are going through that. There is no aspect of our lives that is now not, cannot be commodified. Um, and, you know, I, I guess things like, uh, you know, there's always been a sex of sex, uh, sale of sexual services, but now it's become a huge industry and an international industry. Uh, the idea of, of, of brides, you know, internet brides, that too has become huge. Everything is now up for sale. And in a way, what COVID did was to point out to us the dangers of this um, relentless commodification of, of nature. And, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic began with encroachment on nature, on, on care. And we saw when you shut down the economy, you know, care has to go on. And of course, on inequality, it is the very rich that continue to make money through COVID and the very poor that have suffered and really uh, you know, levels of poverty have gone down, uh, have gone up. Uh, next slide, please. We'll skip that. So we're now in an era of trying to work out what are we going to do with measuring how we progress. It's obviously, you know, just focusing on how much we produce for the market is not giving us a very good story. It's not a very good criteria on judging how well we're doing or how well nature is doing. And so I'm not going to go through this, but there are many different metrics of well-being. Some of them include the GDP as a part of the measures. Some of them um, abandon the GDP and focus entirely on well-being. You have Bhutan with its happiness index. You have a, another happiness measure going around uh, on a global scale with the backup of the UN. Uh, the OECD is talking about a dashboard of indicators with the GDP as one of it, but also looking at other things that matter, education, uh, natural resources, and so on. So we are slowly, if not moving away from the GDP, we are working out that it is not enough. It is simply, uh, you know, it's, it's a pathway to disaster. Final um, slide, please. So in all of this, and I kind of want to wrap up, since my time is running out, is it is time for those of us who have been concerned with gender justice to ask, what is a well-being economy? If that is what is going to take the place of a GDP economy, which is how people are talking about it, we have to ask ourselves what growth was about. That it was never an end in itself as it has been treated, but it is about supporting life, the living core of the planet and of human beings. So we have to think about growth as a way of achieving these goals rather than as an end in itself. And that would mean to provide livelihoods for all. It would also mean to stop treating unpaid care work as something that is infinitely available and that the environment is a limitless resource that can be used for free. And it also means that we must put economic policies at the service of sustainability, justice, and equality Next slide, please. And so what I want to conclude with is what I think are emerging as what people like me would like to, uh, if you like, mobilize around. And that would be first and foremost to take this unpaid work that is being done day in, day out across the world that doubled in its demands during COVID and to accept that however it's produced, the care, and capabilities of people, whether it's produced for an unpaid basis at home or whether it's produced as a, as a paid activity in the marketplace, that has to be the center of our attention. Because no matter what's going on in the world, if human beings have the, the, the capabilities and have the care to uh, withstand crisis, then we can ride the future without the kind of uh, costs that we've seen. But that would mean, of course, that we have to re-embed markets. Polanyi talked about disembedding markets from society. We have to re-embed markets. And we have to recognize that what is being produced in the name of care and capabilities, that is the looking after the elderly, children, and so on, investing in their human capabilities, in their education skills and knowledge, cannot be left to the market, of course. They are not a commodity that can be easily profitable 
and you know sold in through private sector because many people will ne never be able to afford it. And that is we don't have why well, we don't have that many markets in uh, in the uh, global south. So making these issues cap the caring capability of public good, which needs to be provided by the state, addressing gender discrimination in the labor market because livelihoods will continue to be whatever kind of economy we see in the future, people have to continue to produce and continue to properly sell and buy their goods, but not in the discriminatory way, you know, with the unpaid care as a huge barrier for women to participate in the public sphere, to participate in the markets. We need differentiated, common and differentiated fiscal responsibilities. And that means not only the climate funds of uh, loss and damage, doesn't only mean the special drawing rights or that it also means we have to tax our, ourselves and i think our part of the world has a very low tax to gdp ratio so we also need to start thinking about taxing the very wealthy in our countries and that would provide quite a lot of the finances that we need we need to democratize governance and for that i think um that is not going to happen with political will because so much political will has now been co-opted by the corporations and by the wealthy. And so there is a need now, I think, and has always been for social movements to grow up from the grassroots and to hold their governments more accountable and to democratize governments. Though I can see that we're not in, a, in an era of, of history where all of that looks very promising, but it is really the only way forward. And I think for me, the question that I would like to look at is, all these different uh, versions of growth or degrowth that are coming up in the in the wake of um, our, our consciousness of climate disaster is what would a, a gender just transition look like for feminists across the world? I don't think that that issue as is as yet spelt out in all the different variations of the future agenda for growth or well-being. So I'll end there. Thank you very much, Professor Kavir. Um, we'll open up for questions now. We have about 20 minutes. Um, I can't really hear you. Oh, can you not? Let me come closer to you. Um, is this better? Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Much better, much better. Um, thank you, Professor Kabir, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, my question was really, you know, if you go back to sort of commodification. Can we get rid of the slide? Yeah. Um, if we go back to sort of the kind of rise of commodification and a sort of market um, relationships going to scale, I think one of the things that's happened is that you've also kind of destroyed community arrangements. Um, you know, self-interest at a very quotidian level has taken hold of us in different spheres, whether it's education, whether it's supply of services. So when we talk about re-embedding markets, um, you know, we're really thinking about, in some sense, reconstructing community relations. Now, one part of it, which I sort of completely support, which is also bringing the public sector into it, and recognizing some forms of labor, which you support through the state. But I'm wondering, sort of outside the state, you know, how do we go about, in some sense, constructing relationships which are based on greater degrees of altruism, um, as opposed which to- Which are based on? Altruism, as opposed to pure self-interest, or very mm -hmm. narrow self-interest. Yeah. yeah. I think when I talk about social movements and when I talk about, you know, building up from the grassroots, I think I'm also talking about how do we reestablish bonds of solidarity, um, uh, the, the willingness to do something because it's good for a collective rather than because it's good for oneself. And I think the other thing that was left out of the GDP was voluntary work. You know, that didn't count. So 
we do want to see um, some decentralization of the provision of public goods. And I went to a UNESCO launch of their latest report, which I recommend everybody reads. And in that launch, they talked about, you know, privately produced public goods. In other words, the things we do as communities, including the generation of culture and art, these are not done, these cannot be done by the state. But we should have a, you know, when we, when we talk about re-embedding, it means make, opening up the space for people to produce things that are for the collective good in order that they also have some say in their own lives. So I would say that decentralization of governance would be a very important part of the, you know, I didn't have time to really elaborate on an accountable state, but an accountable state must also mean accountability at the local level. I think the only, you know, caveat I have with ideas about the community is that the community in the past was often riddled with inequality. You know, it was organized along lines of caste, gender, ethnicity, and various kinds of divisions. And I've always been a very pragmatic person, and I've always tried to, uh, you know, frame my argument in ways that you want to influence policymakers, you know. But I'm beginning to see that actually that's not, the policymakers are very much captured by the powerful. And I think now what we need to do is make our arguments to each other, you know, to different groups of people, because we are trying to talk about a different kind of world and a different set of values. And that is the hardest thing in the world if you've grown up with the idea of the pursuit of self-interest. You know, one of the phrases I hear again and again, and you might have heard as well, is that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. So we are embarking on a very challenging journey. And I, for one, am much more interested in building the popular will rather than the political will. Because I think we can only change the politics of the times if there is uh, there are popular movements. But those, because we're in the in, a, in an era of very divided people across the world, and we're seeing it every day, it's a huge challenge. But in a way, we have no other choice. So that's all there is to it. So that's the future. Um, yeah, hello, Naila. This is Ijaz Nabi, going back many, many years. Um, my, my question to you is that, you know, those of us who travel a lot across the global north and the global south, we are aware that when you have these abstract notions of well-being, um, it's hard to tell where people are really better off. Uh, and yet all the measurements of well-being that we are familiar with would suggest extreme inequality between global north and global south. So. Your lecture is uh, very appealing because it 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 reaches some of that uh, that that discord that I feel when I travel across countries. You know, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to have to ask someone to relay your question to me because I'm having real trouble. Uh, but if you you could finish your question and then one of the moderators could. Okay, so my main question was that you are you are touching on something that now I can hear you. <laughs> okay, so my question was that you are touching on something that we are those of us who travel a lot are aware of, but but to actually come to grips with it will require enormous amount of knowledge uh, to understand that because a lot of the policies are driven by what is currently being measured uh, and therefore are unsatisfactory when you really look at well-being in, in, the, in the broad sense in which you've talked about, in which I have felt when I travel across uh, the global north and the global south. I lost the last part. Um, 
Aisha, someone, could you just tell me the last part? There is a lot of technical knowledge required, but I think having that conversation, because one thing I listed and didn't have time to go into is all the different metrics that are on the on the uh, on the table, right? The capacity to collect the information for those different metrics is not going to be the same across the world. But to me, having that conversation. I think there's going to be a big UN summit next year, and you know the Secretary General has got called for a beyond growth mindset. That's the it's having that conversation to me is a first step. You know, there will be we already have the SDGs. There are some measures of the SDGs we might want to hold on to. Different countries may have their own versions of what they want to measure. But the point is to get those countries to want to measure something different apart from the GDP. So my own, you know, I've been listening to different groups of people talking about you know, the genuine progress in the index and the dashboard of indicators, all of that. Which is the perfect set of indicators? I don't know. But I think we can all agree that some of those indicators can be, we are, we are measuring now health, um, education, life expectancy, nutritional levels, all of these things are there now. We may want to add other things. But the fact that we have come to a stage where we are willing to judge progress in terms that are not entirely determined by GDP is, I think, a step forward. I'm... You know, I also think that a lot of investment has to be made in different countries to enable their statistical offices to collect those measures. And I, I myself have no, you know, um, firm view about which is the best set of measures. But I think that is the conversation we should be having and continue to be having. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kapit. It was wonderful. Uh, it provided some new ideas. Uh, if you can expound one of that, that uh, you talked about shift from economy of commodity to the economy of well-being. So actually, in terms of the economics in general, there has been a lot of political uh, economy in which there are interest groups. And when you say a shift from economy of commodities uh, to the economy of well-being, so how uh, this will be supported and opposed by different interest groups, and how you see that which trends, trends are going to support it and needs to be strengthened. Uh, whereas, you also talked about a popular will uh, versus the political will, that how do you connect the dots with these terminologies? Um, did you, could you, okay, could you just repeat that question in a, uh, sorry, in a just asked, yes. Uh, so I got the last bit. And the first bit was, uh, about the uh, economy of commodity, then it was shifting to the economy of well-being. Uh, so did you shift from the economy of commodities to the economy of Of well-being, how do we deal with the vested interests? If you have any thoughts 
Yes. I think those are two connected issues. And I am as aware as anybody else of the kind of political... I mean, the, I think a lot of the conversation about green growth is about trying to avoid where we should really be going is about rethinking the whole growth paradigm. And I'm very, very aware that there are strong interests, uh, you know, and when we see the capture, not only of wealth, but of media, of, of governance, you know, in, in this country, we are going through the scandals of the way that um, responses to COVID were commodified, you know, through corruption, cronyism, and so on. So I'm as aware as anybody else that we are talking about a paradigm shift of such enormity that it's not going to happen overnight. So I think all of us have to decide for ourselves. And, you know, this is not an answer I would have given at an, at an earlier phrase, you know, because you you knew what you were talking about, you knew what policymakers were interested in, you wanted to influence them, you would frame your arguments in that way. Now I'm not sure that policymakers are all that interested because they are a part of the vested interest. And so I think now the conversation has to be a horizontal one. And it has to be across, uh, you know, activist groups. What I'm very heartened by is stepping out of academia and looking at the way in this, in this part of the world and, you know, I think in, in South Asia, there are activist groups that are beginning to raise these questions. But until those activist groups start to influence ordinary people, you know, that popular will will not develop. So I think for me, you know, as an academic, there's only so much one can do. But I think one of the things I can do and one of the things that all of us can do is talk outside our echo chambers and talk outside the ivory tower and start to make, you know, what needs to be done and why it needs to be done a part of the conversation at the grassroots level. So vested interests, you know, what are we going to do with them? You know, they have they have the arms, they have the, the technology, they have the media, they have all of it. The only thing that people who care about the future and care about a, a more just future, the only thing they have is each other. So I think the conversation that we have to have now is with each other or with people who are likely to change their minds. But I, I, I have no answers at all. Because this is not, we're not asking for a small shift. We are asking for something, as I said, unimaginable, which is the end of capitalism as we know it. Thank you, Professor Kabir. This is a very insightful talk. Uh, I'm just following up on uh, Professor Nabi's question as someone who travels between East and West. Um, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm a part of a very close-knit group where somebody offered me a ride to the airport, somebody's dog sitting for my dog. The book that I was reading on the plane was borrowed from, the, from, from another friend. So part of it is, is how do we even start to measure these kinds of things that were part of the community? But part of it is, is I've seen, this was what Pakistan looked like when I was growing up here. This is what my dado and nano used to do. And I feel like, um, there's been a degeneration of ethics and values that has come with growth, with extreme self-interest. And I'm wondering, how do we even start to recapture what was lost, and how do we start to build back those ethics, those values, in our communities? Because all I see when I move back is who's wearing what and competition with everybody else. And so I'm wondering, are there ways to start to document what we lost um, as, as we went along with growth? I think, you know, the feminists that I talk to talk about the ethics of care, of care and responsibility. And I think if we have to have, you know, if we have a concerted movement about what are the things that we want outside of the market, what are the things that should not be governed by a profit motive, you know, and they include, I would say you start with a universal health service. You know, to what extent can we all participate in an economy that delivers health to everyone without seeking to make a profit from it? I think you develop an ethics 
from this conversation about how does one um, imagine a future where not everything has to be produced with an eye to its price in the marketplace. And therefore, and I know we have very um, imperfect states, but the one reason why the issue of the state comes up again and again for me is it is the only institution in society that has the mandate to care about every citizen. Corporations don't, communities don't, NGOs don't. So I think a part of the struggle is how does one make the state assume its mandate for taking responsibility? And I think those are the words, you know, care, responsibility, um, accountability. You know, those are the values that you want to recover and you cannot will them into existence. You have to reorganize the way that we do things. And this is another thing which is worth thinking about. Across the world, people are experimenting with what they call the circular economy or solidarity economies. You know, they're trying to find ways of uh, re-establishing mutuality. Now, these are very small experiments. But we can learn from them and we can start thinking about scaling up. For me, I think what COVID did is it told me what all of us share as human beings in common. And that's why the issue of health and food, what used to be called basic needs, and we would like to see them as basic rights. If one could, you know, um, in this country, in Britain, you know, we privatize water, the supply of water. And what we are seeing is a dumping of sewage in the oceans and the rivers. I don't know if that kind of message is changing people's mindsets. You know, this is what happens. If, if the vote worked in this country, in Britain, we would renationalize the railways. You know, we would renationalize water. Because the how it, everybody uses trains, and you've begun to understand the ineffic inefficiencies of a privatized railway system. You've begun to understand the danger and the damage of privatized water. So I I I agree with you about the ethics and what kind of a there is no such thing as market ethics, right? You have a market profit motive. But I feel like the only way we can reestablish an ethics of care and responsibility is through our actions. And that's why I think one of the things that climate, the whole issue of, of you know, protecting the environment has both an individual component and a collective component. An individual component about, you know, how we, through our actions, try to do something about climate disaster. But also we need collective action. You know, we obviously need uh, corporations to stop doing what they're doing. We need the state to do more of what it is not doing. So I'm, I'm not giving you a very coherent answer, but I don't know who has a very coherent answer. All we know are the kind of values we want to reestablish. And that we can only do through practice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hello, Naila Asad Saeed here. <coughs> um, very wonderful talk, and as usual, uh, a lot to ponder on. I was just thinking that uh, what you've given us is essentially a manifesto for a new social democracy or a social democratic okay you can't hear me no this mic seems to work better okay this one thank you for coming here no no
is essentially a, a manifesto for a, a social democratic political movement uh, which incorporates gender and uh, climate issues a lot more explicitly than the traditional ones did. Um, the challenge, of course, is to break through uh, the neoliberal sort of uh, consensus that we live under. Um, and for it all depends on where on the pegging order of nation states a particular country is. So you could be fairly isolated like Bhutan and perhaps do a few things under a monarchy, but uh, for messier countries like Bangladesh or Pakistan or others, um, it seems like a long haul, but a, but a worthwhile one. Um, and I think that what perhaps we need is a lot more coherence coming together. And if one speaks academically, a new theory of social democracy, um, j just just an observation and perhaps something you want to uh, expand on. Yeah. You know, I think we are all aware of the challenges. And I think if this region, and now I'm talking about the region you're in, if this region of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh could get its act together. It, that itself would be such a huge uh, barrier overcome. You know, but so far, you know, we can't. I, I can't travel from Bangladesh to Pakistan. You know, I have to go via Sri Lanka or I have to go via the Middle East or, you know, it's it's ridiculous. So I'm very deeply aware of the challenge, and I listen to uh, one of the kind of more articulate voices than me on this whole issue of the well-being economy and degrowth, and that is Jason Hickels. So I watched a video of a conference of him talking to the Dutch parliament. And I think this is before the right-wing guy got in. And I could hear the skepticism in some of the politicians because they are going to have to sell this message to their constituents who may not be as fully aware of the reasons why we are talking about a different kind of economy and so on. And there seems to be a lot of, in the message about a new, a new way of thinking, a lot of austerity involved. Not austerity of the kind that the IMF talks about, but you know, changing our lifestyles to be, not to be over consumers. You know, so in a sense, I guess, you know, this is a movement or a, a set of ideas that have been growing over time, but. I, I say to myself, you know, when I think about how, what the barriers are in the way, that we have no other choice. That even if the changes don't happen in our own lifetime, people with their children and their children's children, maybe it'll happen for them. Because if we don't do something, then I, you know, I'm, I'm not a climate change expert, but I, I think the result will be disaster. So in a sense, you know, we could live with inequality rising, 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 and we've seen it rising, rising, rising. And nobody seemed to care. And I think now, because we're seeing that along with that inequality rising is the climate falling apart, and now it affects everybody. So I think if there has been a moment to intervene in the interests of a better kind of what you call a democratic social order or whatever, I think the time is now. And um, and I think we can all, you know, whatever walk of life we work in, whether we're activists, whether we're in the government or whether we're academics, I think we need to cooperate or coordinate our efforts to try and make sure that the message is heard across, across the world. And in the villages of Pakistan and Bangladesh and so on. Because it's actually at the village level, at the community level, that the, that the momentum for change may come. Thank you, and I'm very sorry that I couldn't join you, but at least I saved some carbon emissions by not flying out. <laughs> <laughs>